The exploration of advanced technology in ancient Egypt invites us to reconsider the narrative of human progress and the linear model of technological evolution. It raises profound questions about the transmission of knowledge, the potential for lost technologies, and the remarkable ingenuity of ancient civilizations. In this documentary, we will examine some of the most compelling cases of advanced ancient technology found in Egypt, delving into the evidence of sophisticated engineering, acoustics, and possibly even electricity. The Assyrian. The Assyrian, a monumental ancient structure in Abydos, approximately 350 miles south of the Great Pyramid of Giza, remains a subject of profound mystery and debate. Its architectural sophistication and unique characteristics have led some to speculate that it might be the product of a much older, advanced ancient civilization possessing technology far beyond what is traditionally attributed to the Egyptians of the Pharaonic era. One of the first puzzles the Osirian poses is its architectural design, which deviates significantly from the typical temple structure found in ancient Egypt. Unlike the linear, rectangular layout common to most Egyptian temples, the Assyrian features a complex, L-shaped configuration. This anomaly raises questions about the intentions behind its design and construction. Further complicating matters is the Osirian's relationship with the Temple of Seti I, as it appears to predate the latter, suggesting it was a significant site long before Seti I decided to build his temple adjacent to it. The sheer scale of the Assyrian is breathtaking. Massive rose granite blocks, some weighing 100 tons, form the core of this structure. These colossal stones were quarried from Aswan, located a staggering 200 miles away. The logistical challenges involved in moving these massive blocks across such distances, only to be placed in a desert location several miles from the Nile, are monumental. The transportation and placement of these enormous blocks defy the capabilities attributed to ancient Egyptians. The question then arises, how were these gigantic stones moved and precisely placed without any known evidence of advanced machinery? The architecture of the Osirian further fuels this enigma. The site, featuring a complex, double-layered roofing system and about a dozen chambers, showcases a level of architectural sophistication that seems out of reach for a civilization equipped with primitive tools. Such complexity, particularly the interlocking wedges and precision in stacking the massive blocks, suggests a level of engineering knowledge not typically associated with ancient Egypt. The use of granite, a material far more challenging to work with than the more commonly used limestone, indicates a technological prowess that the ancient Egyptians, as far as historical records show, did not possess. Another mystery of the site is that it lacks any Egyptian hieroglyphs, arts, or artifacts. Absolutely nothing can link this site to the ancient Egyptians. All throughout the history of Egypt, temples and monuments built by the Egyptians were regularly renovated, and with each renovation, additional artworks and hieroglyphs were added. Yet in the Osirian, we don't see anything like that. Furthermore, the Osirian's subterranean layout is highly unusual for Egyptian temple architecture. It is situated 15 feet below the ground level, a feature that is both unique and puzzling. Some researchers propose that this could be due to the temple being much older than the surrounding structures, possibly predating the sands and soil that have accumulated over millennia. There are also water erosion patterns found on the limestone enclosure around the site, which some researchers argue could only have occurred if the structure was built before the end of the last ice age, a time when the climate in the region was much wetter. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect of the Assyrian is its subterranean nature and the presence of water. Modern seismic technology has revealed that the structure extends at least 50 feet or 15 meters below the current floor level, 
suggesting that what is visible today is merely the uppermost portion of a much larger construction. Moreover, seismic tests indicated the presence of hollow chambers within this depth. Just imagine what is hidden inside these underground chambers. Archaeologists still can't explore these depths due to the water that can't be pumped out as it constantly refills. The Assyrians' hydraulic system is characterized by an intricate network of channels, basins, and possibly sluices, designed to control and manipulate the flow of water within the complex. The precision in the design and execution of these features indicates a deep understanding of hydraulic engineering principles, including water flow dynamics and pressure management. Comparative analysis with known dynastic Egyptian technology reveals stark differences in the sophistication of water management techniques. While the Egyptians were skilled in utilizing the Nile for agriculture through basic irrigation canals and basins, the complexity and precision observed in the Osirian's hydraulics are unparalleled in other contemporaneous Egyptian works. This discrepancy raises questions about the origins of such advanced engineering knowledge, suggesting the involvement of a civilization with a higher degree of technological advancement than previously recognized. James Westerman, a researcher, historian, and archaeologist, has dedicated several decades to studying the mysteries of the Assyrian. To study what's hidden beneath the water, Westerman decided to pump out the water with a powerful pump capable of removing 500 gallons of water per minute, which is around 1,900 liters. Shockingly, the water level continued to replenish itself at a rate that outpaced the pumping capacity. The source and mechanism of the water's emergence remained a mystery. In the words of Westerman, Somehow water is emerging from inside this structure. That's unique. There shouldn't be water coming out of the desert, especially pressurized water. There's something strange going on there. In 2023, Westerman's team employed advanced technology that was able to monitor pressure, temperature, conductivity, and chemical properties of the water in the Assyrian, and he compared the results with the surrounding wells in the area. Preliminary results showed that the water within the Assyrian indeed possesses unique characteristics and came from a different source or pathway compared to the other local water sources. In his words, I have determined through research that water flowing into the Osirian is different from ambient water at this location. The Osirian's water has a different chemical composition and isotropic profile. Why? The water is under pressure and flows into the Osirian as though it were being forced up through rock like a geyser, but water is not reaching the Osirian through bedrock. What is propelling it? My research so far indicates that the water in the Osirian is unique. It is not coming from the local aquifer or from the Nile River several miles away. Further scientific investigation will help me determine where it's coming from. Hydrologic studies show that the water in the Osirian was drinkable, and after filtering it, Westerman started drinking the water, stating that it did not have any predominant taste. He continuously drank from the filtered water from the Osirian, and after some time, something remarkable happened. He experienced an unexpected improvement in his eyesight, and although he has been nearsighted since he was a kid, after taking an eye test, it was determined he no longer needed glasses. Ever since, Westerman continues to drink this water, believing in its healing properties. Another anomaly about the water was a strange temperature fluctuation that wasn't natural. It was as if something was heating the water beneath the Assyrian. The water surrounding the structure is measured at 16.9 degrees Celsius, or 62.5 degrees Fahrenheit. While remarkably, the water within the pipe registers at 23.8 degrees Celsius, or 74.8 degrees Fahrenheit. This presents a notable deviation, which seems to contravene the second law of thermodynamics, 
which states that heat cannot spontaneously transfer from a cooler to a warmer body. This suggests that some unknown force is warming the water inside the pipe, despite it being enveloped by cooler water. No one knows where and what is the source of the water, how it replenishes so quickly in the middle of the Egyptian desert, and what is the scale of the entire complex that is now underground. The Jed Pillar The Jed Pillar and the Ankh are iconic symbols of ancient Egypt. While separated by thousands of years and vastly different cultural contexts, a comparison of the Jed Pillar and Tesla's technological innovations reveals a striking similarity. The Jed Pillar, with its distinctive appearance featuring a broad base, a column-like body, and multiple horizontal bars at the top, holds a revered place in ancient Egyptian mythology and iconography. It is often interpreted as a symbol of stability and regeneration, closely associated with the god Osiris. In the mythological and religious context of ancient Egypt, the Jed was a potent symbol of the enduring nature of life and the order of the universe. Comparing the Jed pillar to Tesla's technology might seem far-fetched at first glance. However, the comparison becomes intriguing when considering the symbolic representation of energy and power in both contexts. The Jed pillar, as a symbol of stability and regeneration, can be metaphorically linked to the concept of continuous energy flow and the perpetual cycle of life and renewal. Tesla's work particularly his experimentation with wireless energy and electromagnetic fields, resonates with this idea of a continuous, omnipresent source of power. Some speculative theories suggest that the Jed Pillar could represent an ancient knowledge of electrical power or energy, drawing parallels to Tesla's vision of harnessing and distributing energy. These theories propose that the Jed, with its columnar shape and horizontal bars, bears a resemblance to components of electrical systems or devices used for energy transmission. Zayat el Aryan The mysterious site of Zayat el Aryan, situated between the Giza Plateau and Abu Sur, has been a subject of considerable intrigue and speculation, particularly due to the fact that the Egyptian government restricted access to this site and completely buried it, denying any archaeological investigations. The only information we have about this incredible site is from Egyptologist Alessandro Barsanti, who investigated the site in the early 20th century before access to the site was completely restricted. The level of architectural sophistication evident at Zayat el Aryan has given rise to theories suggesting that it may have been built by a technologically advanced civilization, possibly predating the conventional timeline of ancient Egyptian history. The primary structure at Zayat el Aryan is often referred to as the Unfinished Pyramid. It consists of a square base measuring approximately 650 feet on each side, with a deep, T-shaped central shaft cut into the bedrock. This shaft, which descends about 100 feet below ground level, is an engineering marvel in itself, considering the hardness of the bedrock and the precision required to excavate such a structure. The precision and scale of this excavation pose significant questions about the tools and technologies available to the ancient Egyptians. The conventional understanding of Egyptian tool sets, primarily composed of copper and stone tools, seems inadequate to undertake such an ambitious and precise project. Theories suggesting that Zayed el Aryan was built by a technologically advanced civilization are fueled by several factors. Firstly, the precision of the excavation work is extraordinary, with the shaft's walls being almost perfectly vertical and smooth. This level of precision suggests the use of advanced surveying equipment and cutting tools, possibly hinting at a level of technological sophistication not yet acknowledged in ancient Egyptian history.
The argument is further supported by the lack of any hieroglyphics or inscriptions at the site, which is unusual for Egyptian monumental structures and leaves the pyramid's purpose and the identity of its builders shrouded in mystery. The strange thing about the site was that the pit was intentionally filled with a tangled mass of heavy limestone blocks, hinting at a deliberate effort to conceal or protect whatever lay beneath. After excavating the limestone blocks with which the site was buried, Barsanti and his team found a massive foundation of pink granite blocks, which differed from the previously uncovered limestone blocks. One of these blocks was enormous, weighing around 30 tons. The discovery of this granite block, along with subsequent findings of more granite blocks and an enormous 30-ton pink granite block forming the foundation of a sort of pavement, led Barsanti to believe that he had found the entrance to a subterranean world, possibly filled with untold treasures or significant historical artifacts. One of the most remarkable discoveries at the Zayed El Aryan site was a large oval vat made of pink granite, polished like a mirror and intricately carved out of one of the pavement blocks. The vat's protection, involving a layer of lime and a thick bed of well-spread clay, suggests it held great importance, possibly containing something of value or significance. The side walls of the vat were lined with a black band, possibly the residue of some liquid, pointing to its use in a unique and unknown process. The vat's design and the evident efforts to preserve its integrity suggest it was an integral part of a sophisticated process, possibly related to energy generation or storage. During the excavation of the site by Barsanti and his team in 1905, a massive storm hit Egypt and the pit at Zayed el Aryan. The torrential rains filled the pit with over 10 feet of water. Incredibly, a few hours after the storm, the water level in the pit abruptly dropped. Surely, Barsanti asserted, this must be because the water was seeping down into some sort of subterranean chamber, into the hidden apartments he believed were waiting to be found beneath the pit. Between the weight of the blocks, the cement-like mortar and the interlocking pattern, the work was the most difficult his team had ever undertaken. But to Barsanti, this only proved his point. Surely, whoever had constructed the site had gone to such great lengths to make the blocks of the floor unmovable because they were meant to conceal a hiding place, something extremely important. Unfortunately, the work was so difficult that, again, Barsanti ran out of money before he could solve the mystery. Then World War I broke out, shutting the sights of Egypt down to further exploration. In 1917, Barsanti unexpectedly died at the age of 59. Rather than continue Barsanti's work, Egyptologists simply forgot about the site, leaving the mystery of what lay beneath it unsolved. The sudden restriction of access to the Zayed el Aryan site by the Egyptian government in the 1960s, just as interest in its mysteries was renewed, only deepens the intrigue. A military base now stands over the site, and no one can enter it. While definitive proof remains elusive, the architectural complexities and unexplained features of the Zayed el Aryan site, coupled with its proximity to the Great Pyramid, suggest that it may have been part of an advanced technological system for energy generation and distribution in ancient Egypt. The Saqqara Bird The Saqqara Bird an artifact found in 1898 within the confines of the Saqqara necropolis has stirred the imagination and curiosity of many. This object, which is over 2,000 years old, is made of sycamore wood and measures about 14 centimeters or five and a half inches in length. At first glance, it resembles a bird. However, upon closer examination, its features provoke speculation that it could represent something far more sophisticated, an ancient model of an aircraft. The artifact features a flat body, wings that are straight and aerodynamically shaped, 
and what appears to be a rudder or tail fin, characteristics that are strikingly similar to modern aircraft rather than the typical representations of birds in ancient Egyptian art. Unlike other avian figurines found from ancient Egypt, which typically emphasize detailed plumage and anatomical accuracy, the Saqqara bird has a vertical tail, a feature that is absent in depictions of birds but crucial in the design of aircraft for stability and control. But another crucial thing about this artifact is the place where it was found. Ancient Egyptians meticulously placed items within tombs for practical reasons, models of real-life objects intended to assist or transport the deceased in the afterlife. Given this context, the Saqqara bird's presence raises intriguing questions. Unlike the practical, everyday items typically found, an aircraft would serve a unique purpose, aligning with the belief that the dead ascended to the skies. Could this carving then represent a scale model of an actual ancient aircraft? The Saqqara bird's distinct vertical tail fin, absent in natural avian anatomy, hints at an understanding of stabilization mechanisms essential for flight. However, for true aerodynamic efficiency, a horizontal tail fin is critical, a feature the Saqqara bird does not possess. Or does it? Upon closer examination, we can see a series of marks, which many believe were where such a fin might have once been attached. Modern technological tools were used to simulate and test the aerodynamic properties of the Saqqara bird, enhanced with a hypothetical horizontal tail fin through computer flight simulators. The results from this high-tech analysis were nothing short of astonishing. The Saqqara bird, when modeled with a horizontal tail fin, exhibits remarkable gliding capabilities, adhering to principles of aerodynamics that weren't formally understood until the 19th century. This revelation suggests that the ancient Egyptians' conceptualization of flight could have been more advanced than previously acknowledged, presenting a design that, in some aspects, surpasses the initial models of modern gliders. The Serapium of Saqqara The Serapium of Saqqara is an ancient Egyptian necropolis located near Cairo, which is renowned for its assemblage of massive granite boxes believed to be sarcophagi. These boxes, crafted with astonishing precision, have sparked considerable debate about their creation. The extraordinary craftsmanship evident in these granite boxes suggests the use of advanced technology far beyond what is traditionally attributed to the ancient Egyptians. Each box in the Serapium of Saqqara is hewn from a single piece of granite, a material known for its extreme hardness. The boxes are enormous, with some weighing up to 70 tons, including the lid and base. This means that the blocks from which they were carved would have been weighing around 200 tons. The precision with which these boxes have been crafted is remarkable. Their corners are perfectly square, and the flat surfaces are exquisitely smooth, with an accuracy that rivals modern machining capabilities. This level of precision, achieved several millennia ago, is astounding and has led to the speculation that the ancient Egyptians had access to advanced technology, possibly lost to time. One of the most striking features of these boxes is their interior surfaces, which are equally precise and smooth as the exteriors. Achieving such accuracy on the inside of a stone box, particularly with the tools supposedly available at the time, seems impossible. The walls of the boxes are of uniform thickness, suggesting the use of sophisticated measuring and cutting equipment. This level of uniformity and precision in stonecraft is rarely found in other ancient Egyptian artifacts, leading to questions about the technology and methods used in their construction. Moreover, the process of hollowing out these massive granite blocks would have required significant understanding and control of stone-cutting techniques. The conventional tools of the ancient Egyptians 
primarily made of copper, would have been inadequate for shaping such hard stone with the precision observed. This discrepancy has fueled theories suggesting that the builders of the Serapium possessed advanced technological knowledge, potentially including high-speed drills, diamond-tipped cutting tools, or other sophisticated machinery. Another aspect that intrigues researchers is the purpose of these boxes. Traditionally believed to be sarcophagi for the burial of sacred apis bulls, this explanation has been questioned due to the box's elaborate and precise construction, which seems excessive for mere burial purposes. Some theorists propose that these boxes were used for purposes that required precise dimensions and smooth surfaces, perhaps related to some form of energy manipulation or scientific process unknown to modern science. Additionally, the granite boxes also possess acoustic properties. What is it of the rhythm? The transportation and placement of these massive boxes are also subjects of wonder. The Serapium's underground tunnels are narrow and winding, making the movement of such large objects a logistical challenge. Also, why are there no signs of torches, such as burn marks, anywhere in the Serapium of Saqqara? What kind of lighting did they use to illuminate these underground spaces? In contrast to these theories, mainstream archaeology attributes the precision and craftsmanship of the granite boxes to the skill and patience of ancient craftsmen who, over generations, perfected their stone-working techniques. Critics of the advanced technology theory argue that there is no direct archaeological evidence supporting the existence of machinery or tools sophisticated enough to create these boxes in ancient Egypt. Creating such precision in ancient times would have required not only advanced tools, but also a sophisticated understanding of engineering and geometry. The scale and precision of the boxes in the Serapium are not replicated in any modern granite quarries, indicating that the ancient Egyptians, or perhaps a pre-existing civilization, had access to technology and knowledge that are not yet fully understood. The Schist Disk The Schist Disk is a remarkable artifact discovered in the ancient burial ground of Saqqara. The disk stands out due to its unique characteristics. Measuring approximately two to two and a half feet in diameter, it exhibits a remarkable craftsmanship that has intrigued scholars. Its intricate design features a series of precise, concentric circular patterns with a central hub, reminiscent of a wheel or gear. This intricacy and precision in its makeup led many to suggest that it could be a remnant of a lost ancient technology or even part of an advanced mechanical device. The disk is notably composed of quartzite, a material known for its hardness, rated 7 out of 10 on the hardness scale. This fact alone has led to questions about its creation, as the dynastic Egyptians of the time are not believed to have had the technology to work with such hard materials. Mainstream historians say it was used for directing water. However, the three lobes featured by the disk are not angled in a way that would suggest a function in moving or directing water. Instead, it appears to have been part of a rotating mechanism around a central axis. The craftsmanship displayed in the disc is extraordinary, with thin blades or petals extending from the central hub, each uniformly shaped and symmetrically arranged. Adding to its enigmatic nature are the curious burn marks found on the disc. These marks have not been definitively explained contributing to the overall mystery of the artifact and linking it even more to the theory that it was part of a larger mechanical device or machine. Some have hypothesized that it might have been part of an ancient timekeeping device, an astronomical instrument, or a piece of machinery used for unknown purposes. 
Other artifacts that some connect to the disc are these three pieces, which look very much like some sort of gear parts that were once part of a mechanical device. The speculation that the schist disc and these gear parts were a remnant of advanced technology is fueled by comparisons with artifacts from other ancient civilizations known for their engineering prowess. The intricate design of these pieces bears some resemblance to components found in later technological artifacts, such as the Antikythera mechanism, an ancient Greek device used for tracking celestial movements. This resemblance has led to theories suggesting a shared knowledge of mechanical engineering among ancient civilizations, possibly hinting at a now lost advanced technological tradition. The Valley Temple of Khafre The Valley Temple of Khafre, an integral component of the Giza Pyramid complex in Egypt, is a marvel of ancient engineering and architecture. This temple is among the best-preserved ancient structures in Egypt, having remained nearly intact for thousands of years, largely due to being buried under sand until the 19th century. Its construction exhibits a level of sophistication and precision that many argue could only have been achieved through the use of advanced technology. Constructed with massive blocks of limestone and red granite, some weighing over 150 tons, the temple showcases a level of engineering sophistication that is completely out of place. The supermassive stones are a hallmark of the temple's grandeur, raising questions about the methods used in their transportation and assembly. The Valley Temple's construction technique, involving the precise fitting of massive stones without the use of mortar, is awe-inspiring. The temple's walls are assembled with such precision that they resemble a complex three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. The manipulation of these stones with their various exposed surfaces, corners, and angles shows a level of skill and understanding of stonecraft that is nothing short of extraordinary. In addition to that, the incredible bent stones in the interior present a compelling enigma raising questions about the use of advanced technology in ancient times. These stones, seamlessly integrated into the structure, appear as if they have been skillfully shaped or bent, defying the conventional understanding of ancient stonemasonry. This remarkable feat prompts us to question, how was it possible for ancient builders to manipulate such massive stones with such precision? Could there have been advanced technologies or lost methods at play, enabling them to shape these stones in ways that seem almost impossible with known tools of the era? One of the most intriguing aspects of the Valley Temple is a large black granite block on the internal eastern wall, which differs from the rest of the pink granite wall. Its placement and purpose remain a mystery, with some speculating it could mark an entrance to a subterranean passage. Despite common beliefs that the temple was used for the mummification process and purification of Pharaoh Khafre before his burial, there is a lack of concrete evidence supporting this claim. Some researchers examining the style of stonework suggest that the temple could be far older than what dynastic history indicates. The temple is devoid of paintings and inscriptions, a characteristic it shares with the pyramids. What shocked many was the Valley Temple's resemblance to structures found in distant lands, such as Peru. The similarity in design elements between the temple and sites like Olante Tambo and the Coricancha Temple in Peru is uncanny, leading to speculation about the interconnectedness of these ancient civilizations. This resemblance has fueled debates about the possibility of a shared blueprint or knowledge among these distant cultures, a hypothesis that remains a tantalizing mystery. Research led by figures like John Anthony West, Robert Schach, and Andrew Collins suggests that the Valley Temple, along with the Sphinx Temple, are among the oldest structures on the Giza Plateau, possibly over 10,000 years old. 
The Dagger of Tutankhamun On November 26, 1922, a monumental moment in archaeological history unfolded as British archaeologist Howard Carter, accompanied by Lord Carnarvon, penetrated the sealed chambers of Pharaoh Tutankhamun's tomb. Untouched for millennia, the tomb was a treasure trove, brimming with golden artifacts and decorations. This discovery, one of the most significant archaeological finds to date, opened a window into the opulence and mystery of ancient Egypt. In another video of ours, we discussed in detail the strange death that followed everyone connected to this discovery, starting with Lord Carnarvon, who died four months after the discovery. In the following years, seven members of the expedition died mysteriously, leading many to believe they were cursed. But let's get back to the artifacts found in the tomb. Among the myriad of treasures, the most intriguing was Tutankhamun's collection of daggers, particularly an iron dagger with a gold sheath and handle, discovered alongside the young pharaoh's mummified remains. This dagger, with its exquisite craftsmanship and unusual material, sparked intense interest and debate among historians and archaeologists. The golden sheath and handle were typical of the grandeur associated with Egyptian royalty, but it was the iron blade that was truly extraordinary. In an era dominated by bronze, the presence of iron, a material more precious than gold at the time, was an anomaly. The Egyptians, renowned for their work with copper, bronze, and gold, were not known for iron smelting, which became prevalent only in the first millennium BC, centuries after Tutankhamun's reign. The dagger's quality further deepened the mystery. It was later discovered that the dagger is actually made from a meteorite iron, which makes it even more extraordinary. How was such a sophisticated artifact produced? The Egyptians themselves attributed the dagger's origin to divine intervention, calling it a gift from the gods. This notion fuels speculation about the dagger being a product of a more advanced civilization, or perhaps an extraterrestrial gift. Mainstream Egyptologists confronted with this enigma propose that the Egyptians simply extracted the iron from a meteorite that had fallen somewhere in Egypt. This theory, while plausible, has its shortcomings. Extracting metal from a meteoroid, especially in the Bronze Age, was beyond Egyptian capabilities. Moreover, meteoritic iron is scattered throughout the meteoroid, making extraction without advanced technology impossible. In 1994, X-ray fluorescence spectrometry analysis revealed that the dagger's blade was not ordinary meteoritic iron. The alloy was complex and durable, comprising 89% iron with significant amounts of nickel, cobalt, and chromium, a composition requiring advanced metallurgical skills, unavailable until much later in human history. The dagger's craftsmanship was equally baffling. It lacked any hammer marks, common in metalwork of the period, and its edges were exceptionally precise. This level of sophistication in metallurgy and craftsmanship seemed out of place in the context of Bronze Age Egypt. Intriguingly, Tutankhamun's tomb also housed other mysterious artifacts, like a breastplate adorned with a winged scarab made from an unusual yellow-green gemstone, initially thought to be Chalcedony quartz. Later investigations revealed it to be desert glass, a material formed under extremely high temperatures. The presence of such material alongside the iron dagger added to the enigma of Tutankhamun's artifacts. The desert glass, first discovered in the Libyan desert, resembles trinitite, a type of glass formed during nuclear tests in New Mexico, suggesting extreme heat was involved in its creation. This discovery led to theories about ancient nuclear events or advanced ancient technologies capable of producing such heat, far beyond the known capabilities of Bronze Age civilizations. These findings compel us to reevaluate our understanding of ancient history. 
The technological sophistication evident in Tutankhamun's artifacts suggests knowledge and skills far surpassing what is historically attributed to ancient civilizations. Were these gifts from an advanced, perhaps extraterrestrial civilization, or remnants of a highly advanced yet lost human civilization? The Tanis Cataclysm Tanis, an ancient city that once lay in the northeastern delta of the Nile in Egypt, is a site shrouded in mystery and intrigue. It was a thriving metropolis during various periods of the ancient Egyptian civilization. Despite its significant historical role, Tanis remained shrouded in obscurity until a team of French archaeologists unearthed it in 1939 after 12 years of meticulous excavation. The discovery revealed a scene of profound devastation. Massive statues, obelisks, and stone blocks some originating from the Aswan Quarry over a thousand miles away, were found scattered and shattered. Among these ruins was a fragmented piece, believed to be once part of the largest statue ever created from a single piece of granite. The Colossi of Memnon are two massive stone statues located on the west bank of the Nile, near Luxor. They are about 60 feet tall, or 18 meters and are estimated to weigh around 720 tons. Based on the size of the foot fragment found at Tanis, the full statue is believed to be double the size of the Colossi of Memnon, making it around 120 feet tall and weighing 1,400 tons. This led to pressing questions. How were these enormous stones transported over such distances and what cataclysmic event could have caused such widespread destruction? Adding to the enigma of Tanis is its barren landscape, almost devoid of vegetation, a stark contrast to the surrounding delta's fertility. This peculiarity becomes more intriguing when considering Tanis's biblical identity as the city of Zoan, Biblical verses describe the destruction of Egyptian idols and the laying waste of Upper Egypt, including setting fire to Zoan. Curiously, some of the granite stones at Tanis bear evidence of intense heat exposure, suggesting a catastrophic event involving extreme temperatures. The nature of the damage suggested an event of extraordinary power far beyond the capability of any known ancient human-made fires or traditional warfare techniques of the time. The colossal statues were blown away and scattered around the site, broken to pieces by the immense force. Archaeological excavations at Tanis have revealed that much of the city's remains were buried under 10 to 20 feet of soil indicating that whatever caused the massive destruction also buried the site in the ground, completely erasing it from the face of the world. This pattern of destruction aligns with the theory of an external natural force wreaking havoc on the site, possibly a plasma ejection from the sun, as suggested by Dr. Schock. This catastrophic event might have not only vaporized any living beings in the area, but also dramatically altered the landscape, covering the ancient city with debris and soil. But the Cataclysm of Tanis is not the only mystery of the site. The numerous obelisks, artifacts, and colossal statues, all made from granite, made many researchers like Brian Forster believe they were built using lost high technology. There are also numerous obliterated remains of obelisks at the site, more than any other location in Egypt. These obelisks were often theorized to be part of an energetic system, possibly linked to the pyramids of Giza. Perhaps some sort of malfunction in this energetic system caused the city's destruction. The Unfinished Obelisk at Aswan this gigantic piece of granite lies in the southern part of Egypt, right next to the Nile River. It was left behind thousands of years ago in the Aswan quarries, abandoned due to a crack. It was never relocated or erected, although it was clearly meant to be. 
It measures an impressive 137 feet in length and weighs about 1,170 tons, which, if completed, would have made it the largest single stone monument ever created by the Egyptians. In Aswan, which is a city essentially perched on a giant granite outcrop, there are numerous features in the quarry that indicate the use of advanced technology that could manipulate the hard granite. For example, we can find strange, perfectly round holes, which some say are test holes to check the condition of the granite in the deeper layers before committing to cutting a huge obelisk. These strange holes are completely smooth without any signs of chisels or tools. They look almost as if they were drilled with modern technology. One of these holes is enormous, almost 30 feet deep. Moreover, we can see perfectly straight vertical walls, which are very unusual considering their massive size and perfection. Some believe that this gigantic wall was made after an even larger obelisk block was extracted from the quarry. But how is this possible? What kind of technology could shape and cut hard granite in such a precise way? Moreover, how were the massive granite blocks and obelisks transported? If we go to the unfinished obelisk itself, we can find even stranger marks on the granite surface. The surface of this massive granite slab is adorned with smooth, hollowed out areas, giving the appearance that the granite was scooped out from the obelisk. The term scoop actually comes from several researchers who studied the structure and couldn't find a better explanation than this, saying that the rock seems to have been scooped out like a spoon would do with ice cream. Notably, the sides of the obelisk also exhibit these scooped out features, but in a vertical and almost uniform manner, extending from the sides of the stone down to the ground, where they form straight lines. One of the most fascinating aspects can be observed at the base of another stone near the unfinished obelisk. This particular stone is almost completely scooped out at the base, leaving just a small portion of granite connected to its original location. The peculiar appearance of these features, unique and not seen in other Egyptian structures, poses a challenge to modern archaeology. But how does modern archaeology explain these scoop marks? The traditional narrative suggests that the obelisk, believed to have been commissioned during the time of Hatshepsut, was carved using diorite balls, which the ancient Egyptian workers are believed to have pounded against the obelisk to shape it. This theory sounds ridiculous, considering the test holes that are perfectly smooth, the perfectly flat walls, and the scoop marks that are all the same size. Even if we consider that it's possible to shape the granite block simply by pounding it with a diorite stone, there are areas with limited space around the obelisk that simply can't allow a worker to carry out such a vigorous pounding action effectively enough to produce noticeable results. The same goes for the test holes, with some of them being extremely narrow, clearly offering insufficient space for any pounding movements. Moreover, this ridiculous theory still doesn't explain how the Egyptians planned to have transported this colossal structure had it been completed. The obelisk is situated in a deep pit, and its extraction and transportation to its intended destination would have been an engineering feat of monumental proportions. Perhaps the unfinished obelisk was left here by a civilization that predated the dynastic Egyptians, a civilization that had the technology to manipulate the granite in such a way and be able to actually transport it to its designated place once it's finished. The Dendera Light The Dendera Light is a fascinating topic steeped in mystery and intrigue, centering on the bas reliefs in the Hathor Temple at Dendera. These reliefs have sparked widespread speculation and debate about the possibility of ancient Egyptians having knowledge of electricity. The reliefs in question depict what some interpret as large, elongated objects reminiscent of light bulbs. 
Priests hold these objects aloft, with more miniature figures below them directing the light bulb upwards. Inside them are snake-like forms, which some suggest represent filaments. A two-armed Jed pillar is also present. We already talked about the Jed pillar and how it resembles components of electrical systems or devices used for energy transmission. On another bas relief, a peculiar device is depicted featuring lines extending from the object on the left side. Often likened to a necklace, it also bears resemblance to a stylized technological device. Should the interpretation of these lines as electrical wires hold true, then the spheres might actually represent insulators. This object appears to be connected to a type of battery, which in turn is linked to what seems to be a distribution mechanism. This setup echoes the circuitry designs found in vintage automobiles, particularly in petrol combustion engines, due to its simplicity and efficacy in facilitating continuous electric discharge. The hypothesis that these reliefs depict an ancient form of electrical lighting was popularized by Norwegian electrical engineer and Austrian authors Peter Krasse and Rainer Habeck. They published a book titled Light of the Pharaohs, High Technology and Electricity in Ancient Egypt. Walter Garn, another electrical engineer, even constructed a working model based on the Dendera light, supporting the theory. Many connect the Dendera light reliefs with the mysterious Baghdad batteries, a discovery that further fuels the debate about ancient civilizations and their potential knowledge of electricity. The Baghdad batteries, also known as the Parthian batteries, are a set of terracotta pots dating back to the Parthian or Sasanian periods. Each pot contained a copper cylinder that encased an iron rod, with the cylinder and rod not touching each other, filled with an acidic or alkaline substance, such as vinegar or lemon juice, these pots could have functioned as galvanic cells, essentially early forms of batteries. Many researchers built prototypes of the Baghdad batteries, testing them for electricity, and stunningly, they discovered that the batteries produce low voltages of electricity, proving that the ancients did, in fact, have knowledge of this phenomenon. Secret Entrances of the Sphinx The Great Sphinx of Giza, standing an impressive 66 feet high and stretching 240 feet long, is a monument that captures the world's imagination like few others. Constructed from massive limestone blocks, some weighing up to 200 tons, it holds the title of the largest ancient sculpture in the world, yet its grandeur is matched only by its mystery. To this day, the Sphinx's origins, purpose, and the secrets it may conceal remain a source of debate among historians and archaeologists. The Giza Plateau was known as Rostau, or the Mouth of Passages in ancient times. Does that mean that there really were passages beneath the complex? Passages leading to an underground city containing advanced technology? In the 5th century BCE, the famed Greek historian Herodotus wrote about an extensive underground labyrinth in Egypt, which housed a legendary hall of records containing ancient wisdom. Further accounts by notable historical figures like Strabo and Pliny the Elder in the first century supported these claims, describing an elaborate underground maze associated with the Sphinx and the pyramids. In the fourth century, Syrian philosopher Iamblichus wrote about a tunnel system beneath Giza, accessed through the Sphinx itself. According to his accounts, this entrance was once guarded by a bronze gate and led to the Great Pyramid. In 1935, a significant discovery was made by Hamilton M. Wright and his team. During a massive clearing project in Giza, they uncovered what appeared to be a vast, ancient subway system beneath the Sphinx and the surrounding area. This system included a series of shafts plunging over 125 feet deep with expansive courts and side chambers. 
These findings suggested the existence of an underground city beneath the Giza Plateau, a hypothesis that sparked global interest. However, as quickly as they came to light, these stories receded from public attention, leading to speculations about the nature and implications of these discoveries. Why was such a groundbreaking discovery seemingly dismissed? The idea of a hidden underground network beneath the Sphinx was reignited in the early 1990s, when a team led by Egyptologist John Anthony West and geologist Robert Schock conducted seismic surveys around the Sphinx. Their studies revealed unexplained tunnels and chambers beneath the structure, suggesting that the ancient descriptions could have been more than mere legends. We were not looking for structures under the Sphinx. I was actually looking for subsurface mineralogical changes. But we found some structures. Most importantly, we found a chamber under the left pod. These findings were both groundbreaking and controversial, proposing a complex subterranean world waiting to be explored. However, this wasn't the only staggering discovery made by John Anthony West and Robert Schock. They examined the erosion patterns on the Sphinx and its surrounding enclosure walls, suggesting they were caused by the flow of water caused by heavy rains. But how was this possible considering the Giza Plateau is located in a desert? The climate of the Giza Plateau has been predominantly arid for the last 5,000 years, meaning that such water erosion would have had to occur during a time when the climate was much wetter in the region. This pushes the possible construction of the Sphinx back to a period before the Sahara became a desert, potentially as early as 7,000 to 9,000 BC, or even earlier. Either this was a weird geological anomaly, or the Sphinx might go back to an earlier period. What we had ending the last ice age was huge climatic changes, which put a lot of moisture into the air, which came down as precipitation with huge thunderstorms, etc. And I think a lot of the erosion that we still see on the walls of the Sphinx enclosure go back to that period. The proof that the Sphinx precedes dynastic Egypt by many thousands of years means there was, at some distant past, sophisticated civilization. We cannot sensibly accept the insistence of Egyptologists that the Sphinx is just four and a half thousand years old. The implications of this theory are profound, as it suggests that the Sphinx is several millennia older than the commonly accepted date. The traditional historical belief is that the Sphinx was built by the ancient Egyptians of the Old Kingdom during the reign of the Pharaoh Khafre, around 2500 BC. For this reason, the theories of Shock and West were met with skepticism and opposition, primarily from Dr. Zahi Hawass, the former Minister of State for Antiquities Affairs in Egypt. Hawass limited access to the Sphinx for further research and study, making it challenging for Shok and West to advance their theories or conduct more comprehensive investigations. Supporting Shock's assertions, archaeologist Sharif El Morsi, with over two decades of experience working on the Giza Plateau, proposes that the area was once submerged under a massive flood. El Morsi points to the temple site of Menkair, which he believes was a former lagoon when sea levels were significantly higher, covering the necropolis, the Sphinx, and the surrounding temples and monuments. The evidence, as El Morsi outlined, includes indications of tidal waves and an intertidal zone, suggesting that the Giza Plateau experienced significant flooding, peaking at about 75 meters above the current sea level. Moreover, the discovery of a fossilized echinoid within the limestone used to construct these monuments has fueled the debate. Some researchers argue that the echinoid is evidence of the limestone's ancient origins, dating back 30 million years. However, El Morsi counters this by suggesting that the echinoid was petrified in a more recent epoch, highlighting its near-perfect condition and gravitational positioning on the floor within the intertidal range of the hypothesized lagoon. Adding to the controversy, two Ukrainian scientists, Manichev and Parkomenko, 
presented a study at the International Conference of Geoarchaeology and Archaeominerology in Sofia, positing that the Great Sphinx might be hundreds of thousands of years old. They cite clear indications of water erosion and base their hypothesis on geological studies of the Giza Plateau, asserting that the Sphinx had to have been submerged underwater for an extended period. The idea that the pyramids and the Sphinx could be remnants of a pre-flood civilization is not only confined to academic circles. The concept of a great flood, akin to the biblical story of Noah, is a recurring theme in numerous ancient texts and cultures worldwide. Renowned underwater archaeologist Robert Ballard's Exploration in the Black Sea lends credence to the hypothesis of a catastrophic flood occurring around 5000 BC, aligning with some interpretations of Noah's flood. This global deluge narrative is shared across diverse cultures, from India to ancient Greece and North American Indian tribes, suggesting a collective memory of a significant and worldwide cataclysmic event. The implications of these theories are profound, suggesting that the history of human civilization might be far older and more complex than currently understood. If the Sphinx and the pyramids were indeed constructed by a civilization that predates traditional Egyptian history, it would not only revolutionize our understanding of human history, but also provide evidence of advanced technologies and societal structures existing in a time before what is commonly accepted. Granite Boxes We already mentioned the massive granite boxes of the Saqqara, but we are obliged to mention the many other fascinating and massive granite boxes found in Egypt. Each one of them exhibits details suggesting the use of some form of lost, ancient technology far beyond what has traditionally been understood or accepted. Take a look at this giant granite box displayed at the Cairo Museum. This box, significant yet not widely known, is believed to have been abandoned by the Egyptians due to a mistake in the cutting process. The irregular, slanted cut, deemed an error, led to the abandonment of this particular stone block. However, this apparent mistake inadvertently provides strong evidence of a sophisticated advanced tooling method far surpassing the capabilities attributed to the ancient Egyptians. The cut extends deep into the hard granite, making it impossible to fit a chisel inside. The conventional theory, widely espoused by modern researchers, is that the ancient Egyptians used slow, primitive copper-based saws for cutting granite. Yet, this theory falls short when scrutinized. Trials replicating this method demonstrated an excruciatingly slow cutting rate of only 4 millimeters, or 0.15 inches, an hour. At such a slow pace, it is highly implausible that the artisans would not have noticed and corrected a deviation as significant as the one seen in the granite box. Where the cut should have continued, the stone has been marked with a groove, even this mark is precise and smooth. Moreover, it appears the granite was cut from two sides simultaneously, most likely by two circular saws, with one cutting from above and one cutting from below. To see such a smooth and perfectly precise stone cutting, we have to assume that they were using some sort of sophisticated machine capable of rapidly cutting through granite. We can also see precise saw marks in another granite box in the Cairo Museum, which is just a few steps away. The marks we see here look like the marks left by a type of saw, strikingly similar to a modern bandsaw, but with capabilities suggesting a much higher speed of operation. In contemporary terms, such an advanced cutting mechanism requires the use of diamonds, specifically a diamond-encrusted blade to slice through granite efficiently. The existence of such advanced tooling presents a historical anomaly. During the dynastic times of ancient Egypt, there is no recorded evidence of diamond technology or tools with diamond encrustations being used 
or even existing. Another strange box-like artifact is this one. On top of it, there are a series of circles that are perfectly smooth, most likely made with some sort of machine, as they are completely identical. On the side of the object, there are strange burn marks that left significant damage to the stone. The head of whatever caused this marks must have been immense. The exact purpose of this artifact is still unknown. This box, made from red granite, has even more spectacular marks. Not only is it perfectly hollowed out and shaped with precise right angles, but it also has these strange tube drill holes. These drill holes are exactly the same size, penetrating the granite at an intense depth. It's almost undeniable that these marks were made with an advanced machine rather than simple bronze tools. And if this isn't enough to convince you, take a look at this granite artifact, which also exhibits tube drilling techniques. If you look closer, you can even see the spiral grooves on the piece. These grooves display uniform depth and spacing and are evident in all the drilled holes of the artifact. Given that the holes intersect, the consistency of these grooves would be unlikely if they were the result of an abrasive slurry. Core 7 is a remarkable cylindrical piece of granite discovered near the Great Pyramids that is at least 4,500 years old. This ancient artifact is notable for its perfectly spaced, continuous spiral groove, reminiscent of a vinyl record's grooves. Such precision suggests a level of technology seemingly beyond the capabilities of ancient Egyptian civilization, known to possess only soft copper tools, inadequate for drilling into hard granite. The mystery deepens when considering the nature of the groove. Traditional Egyptian tools, like the bow drill, produced a distinct back-and-forth pattern, unlike the single, continuous spiral found on Core 7. This pattern is more akin to the marks left by modern, rapidly rotating drills, suggesting a drilling method far advanced for its time. Modern machinery capable of creating a similar core operates at high speeds and often employs diamond tips, a material hard enough to penetrate granite. This raises the provocative question of whether ancient Egyptians might have had access to such advanced drilling techniques, potentially involving materials as hard as diamond. The groove's shape on Core 7 not only defies the expected capabilities of ancient Egyptian technology, but also implies a drilling force greater than that of contemporary power drills. Analysis of the spacing between each spiral turn indicates a drilling pressure that surpasses modern equipment, hinting at an unknown, highly advanced civilization or technology. The core was made by a drilling process with greater strength than a modern power drill. What does this tell us? There are no tools of that caliber that we know of. If you were impressed by the granite boxes we showed you so far, you will be stunned by the ones on Elephantine Island. This site is like a graveyard of advanced technology, as it's filled with scattered remains of extremely precise granite artifacts, cut and shaped to perfection. The only structure that was left in relatively good shape is this massive box, which Egyptologists call a shrine. It features a pointed or pyramid-like top, sharply defined, possibly once housing a Benben-like stone or point similar to the Old Kingdom pyramids. Additionally, the box is not completely hollowed out but includes inset edges and a large step or platform inside. The box's interior showcases precise 90-degree corners with tiny inside radii. Around the inset edge, we can find large tube drill holes, which were probably pivot points for some sort of mechanism. The smooth, flat surfaces, sharp corners, and intricate details suggest a level of accuracy that these primitive tools could not achieve. Further examination of the box reveals a semicircular edging running around the top and bottom. This edging, 
seemingly carved from a single piece of granite, is evidently the result of a now-lost technology. What's more shocking is that this granite altar, as they call it, is not a unique creation. The entire site is filled with the broken remains of dozens of such altars, all showcasing the exact same features and precise carvings. It's like the entire site was a modern factory that manufactured these artifacts in large quantities until something happened that destroyed the entire site. And all of these granite boxes and artifacts we showed you are just the beginning. There are countless more, all of which possess features and qualities resulting from advanced machinery. Perhaps the most precise granite box found anywhere in the world is the one discovered beneath the pyramid at Lahun. There, inside a chamber made of polished curved granite stones, we find this remarkable tilted granite box that is perfectly flat along the top side. When researchers measured the four corners of the box with modern equipment, they were stunned to find that they are near identical. A similarly startling mystery can be found at Mastaba 17, a monument located near Medum. Beneath a crumbling pile of mud bricks lies an enormous megalithic stone chamber containing a precision-cut stone box, precisely fashioned with perfect corners inside and out from a single piece of granite. The lid has rising rectangular edges and there are knobs on the ends. Is it possible that all of these granite boxes and artifacts were the leftovers of a lost prehistoric civilization that flourished before the Egyptians? Perhaps this will explain why such sophisticated objects were used for such primitive purposes as sarcophagi, because the Egyptians who found them didn't know their real purpose, just like us today. Abu Rawash Staircase On the desert floor of Abu Rawash, Near the remnants of Jedefre's now-destroyed pyramid, there's a mysterious staircase going deep underground. This site, brought to public attention by researcher Antoine Guigal, and subsequently popularized by others, presents an intriguing glimpse into ancient engineering and the vast, unexplored underground network of Egypt. Guigal, during her exploration, observe the staircase's unique features, the deep narrow cut into the limestone bedrock, its vertical walls, the regular steps, and the remarkable depth it reached, culminating in a pool of dark, muddy water. Contrary to the local guide's identification of the structure as a Roman well, Geigel harbored doubts, given its dissimilarity to Roman wells she had encountered in Italy, Spain, and Egypt. Her speculation leaned towards it being an entrance to an underground network of tunnels, possibly leading to a structure akin to a serapium. Its precise vertical walls and regular steps are reminiscent of the descending corridor into the Great Pyramid, suggesting a sophistication in construction that far surpassed that of the Romans or even the dynastic Egyptians. Adding to the mystery, Gagal noted the staircase's alignment with the sacred city of Sais, hinting at a significance beyond a mere well. Despite its apparent ancient origins, the staircase's purpose and the era in which it was constructed remain shrouded in mystery. No serious excavation effort has been made to unravel the secrets of this site. Gigal's exploration provided a visual feast of the structure from various angles, showcasing its depth and the precision of its construction. However, the lack of commentary or substantial information has left many questions unanswered. Currently, the staircase falls into a forbidden area and is restricted to military personnel only. The Melted Stairs While we're still on the topic of stairs, we can return to the Hathor Temple at Dendera, where we examined the light bulb carvings earlier. At one section of the temple, we can see these stairs that appear to be melted, giving them an almost surreal look against the backdrop of meticulously carved hieroglyphs and imposing columns. The stairs, 
with their surfaces seemingly softened and flowing like wax under intense heat, have led to many theories regarding the nature and cause of this peculiar phenomenon. Some suggest that the melting of the stairs is the result of a deliberate act, perhaps utilizing a technology or method of construction that is lost to us today. This theory leans on the assumption that the ancients had access to knowledge or technology that could apply such intense heat to stone reshaping it without destroying the surrounding structures. Among the more intriguing hypotheses is the idea that the stairs were intentionally altered using a form of ancient chemical manipulation. This would involve applying a substance that softened the stone, allowing it to be molded or reshaped before hardening once again. Such a technique would suggest the ancient Egyptians had a revolutionary insight into chemistry. Skeptics and proponents of more conventional explanations argue that the melting is not melting at all, but a deformation resulting from wear and tear from centuries of use, combined with erosion from environmental factors. The steps, being part of a pathway for countless pilgrims, priests, and visitors over the ages, could have simply been worn down in a manner that, to the modern observer, appears as if the stone had melted. Despite these various theories, no single explanation has universally satisfied the curious and scholarly alike. Abu Ghurab Abu Ghurab is a site often overlooked in the shadow of the majestic Giza Plateau and serves as a crucial piece in examining the clues left by the use of advanced ancient technology. Central to the allure of this site are the meticulously crafted bowls whose origins and purposes spark much debate and fascination. According to mainstream Egyptologists, the massive basins were used to hold sacrificial animal blood, which ran through the round channels cut into the paving. Yet, there is not a single drop of DNA or other evidence to support this theory. Moreover, the placement of the holes near the top rather than at the bottom also makes this theory implausible. The bowls are hewn from large blocks of travertine, and their creation evidently involved the use of ancient high technology and some form of machining. The precise nature of these holes, upon closer inspection, reveals an oval shape rather than a perfect circle, suggesting the use of a specialized drilling technique unknown to modern archaeology. The finish on these artifacts ranges from exceptionally smooth surfaces to sharply angled edges, presenting a stark contrast to the rougher textures found on other parts of the same pieces. On some parts of the perfectly smooth surfaces, we can find additional machining marks. Further intriguing is the suggestion that the shape of these bowls bears a resemblance to components used in modern sonic levitation technology. A proponent of this theory is researcher Alex Putney, who has extensively explored the potential of resonant frequencies and their application in ancient technologies. According to Putney and others who support this viewpoint, the peculiar shapes and precise craftsmanship of the bowls discovered at Abu Ghurab might not have been merely for ceremonial or decorative purposes. Instead, they suggest these artifacts were part of a complex system designed to harness acoustic energy. The theory hinges on the idea that these bowls when struck or otherwise acoustically activated, could generate specific frequencies conducive to levitating objects or influencing matter in a manner currently understood only in the context of advanced physics. But the bowls are not the only out-of-place artifacts at the site. There is this massive granite column fragment showing signs of color. There is this one that has various holes and cuts. There are also strange stones which, when hit from the top, generate resonating tones. And of course, there are various 
tube drill holes. Some of them are extremely precise with evident groove marks. There are also stones with marks from what appears to be a large circular saw. What's even strange about this place is that there are seashells in some parts, making you wonder how old this place really is. Here we can also find a massive multi-block structure known as the Hotep. According to geologists, the five massive blocks composing the Hotep likely originated from a quarry far beyond Egypt's borders, possibly in Turkey. The construction techniques evident in the Hotep further contribute to its intrigue. The use of tube drills is clearly visible in the structure, with striations and overcuts marking the corners of the stone. Parts of the structure are also perfectly smooth, evidently polished with advanced methods. The massive capstone at the center has circular saw marks which are impossible to make with primitive tools. Mainstream Egyptology identifies this artifact as an altar, aligning with the site's classification not as a tomb but as a sun temple. However, some believe that below the capstone, there's a shaft that connects to a subterranean passage leading to Giza. In fact, from the summit of Abu Ghurab, one can observe circular formations beneath the sand from afar. These indentations, which have been present for ages, have led numerous observers to speculate about the existence of significant buried structures there. Judging by all the destroyed and scattered granite blocks and structures at the site, it's evident that this place was destroyed by a massive cataclysmic force that left this place in the state we see it today. It is still unknown what this force was or what the true purpose of the structures was. But judging by the intricately carved stones, we can undoubtedly conclude they were part of a much more sophisticated network, a highly advanced complex left from an unknown civilization. The Abydos Hieroglyphs In the Temple of Seti in Abydos, an extraordinary discovery has stirred a significant debate within the scientific community. It was during an examination by Egyptologist Dr. Ruth Hover that a particularly startling find came to light. In the temple at Abydos, she photographed a wall panel in a section where an overlaying panel with Egyptian hieroglyphics crumbled and fell, revealing an older panel beneath it. This older panel contains figures that suggest representations of advanced technology mirroring that of the modern era. At the bottom appears to be a depiction of an aircraft with a clearly defined rudder. At the top is a shape clearly identified as a modern-day helicopter. To the right of this is a streamlined water vessel, below which is what appears to be a submarine. These representations have sparked intense discussions among scholars and researchers. And incised in the stone itself of this oldest temple along the Nile, I think the images are of ancient technology that we now have. Critics of the advanced technology theory argue that the helicopter and other vehicle-like images are the result of erosions, overcarvings, and the superimposition of hieroglyphs over time. According to this view, what appears to be modern technology is actually a palimpsest, an occurrence in Egyptian hieroglyphics where older inscriptions were overwritten by newer ones due to the limited space on temple walls. However, many are not satisfied with this explanation as the similarities are too striking, with not one, but three depictions of advanced vehicles. The debate over these findings is far from settled. Skeptics argue for more grounded interpretations of ancient symbols, while proponents of Dr. Hover's theories see them as evidence of a civilization far more advanced than previously believed. Machine Manufactured Artifacts The lathe manufactured Egyptian artifacts housed in the Cairo Museum and other institutions worldwide bear witness to incredible precision and the unmistakable marks of lathe use. 
These artifacts, primarily consisting of bowls, vases, and plates, were unearthed near the Steppe Pyramid at Saqqara, with additional pieces found at Giza. They are believed to be extremely old, possibly predating the earliest periods of ancient Egyptian civilization. At the same time, however, they are the finest and most well-manufactured items ever discovered. According to mainstream Egyptologists, these granite artifacts were made with the use of primitive tools, yet many believe that the clean, narrow, and perfectly circular lines found on the objects are evidence of the use of lathe technology. The intricacy and precision of these artifacts, such as vases made from brittle stone like schist and finished to a paper-thin edge, or bowls so perfectly balanced they can rest on a point no larger than a hen's egg, all suggest the use of advanced technology. Interestingly, artifacts of this sophistication were not found beyond the earliest periods of Egyptian civilization, indicating a loss of this specialized knowledge over time. The presence of crude inscriptions on some items, likely added long after their creation, suggests these artifacts were valued and perhaps repurposed throughout Egyptian history. The concentration of these items around the Steppe Pyramid, Egypt's oldest stone pyramid, raises fascinating questions about their use and significance. The craftsmanship displayed in these vase, particularly in their thinness and precision, raises questions about the techniques and tools used in their creation. For example, a vase examined by Flinders Petrie, a pioneering Egyptologist known for applying engineering principles to archaeological findings, was found to have a wall thickness of merely 1 40th of an inch. The collection of over 50,000 vases beneath the Steppe Pyramid, documented by Petrie, highlights the significance of these objects in ancient Egyptian society, who likely inherited these artifacts from a much older civilization. Recent advancements in analysis and scanning technologies have allowed for a closer examination of these vases, with scans revealing astounding levels of precision. The YouTube channel Uncharted X has been part of a research on these objects that scanned them via structured light and CT X-ray, and the results they unveiled were shocking. This technology, typically used in aerospace industries, has mapped the vase's structure with incredible accuracy, showcasing the precision with which these vases were made, revealing that the flatness of the vase's lip was within three thousandths of an inch of being perfectly flat, a level of precision that is difficult to achieve even with modern technology. Moreover, the cylindrical shape of the vase's mouth was found to be perfectly perpendicular to its top within one thousandth of an inch, and its circularity was within thirteen thousandths of an inch of perfection. Such precision, achieved on a vase that is at least five thousand years old and potentially much older, is simply staggering. The notion that these vases could have been made by hand, using primitive tools, is becoming increasingly untenable in the face of such evidence. The precision and symmetry observed in these artifacts suggest the use of machinery or advanced tools that have yet to be discovered or understood. The Giza Complex The Great Pyramid of Giza, an architectural and engineering masterpiece, remains one of the most remarkable achievements in human history, embodying a level of precision and sophistication that still baffles researchers and scholars today. This monument holds within its stone secrets and traces of advanced technology that we are only beginning to understand. Just when you approach the pyramid, you can start seeing these traces of advanced technology. For example, there are many basalt stone blocks with vertical machine marks on them. The presence of vertical lines meticulously carved into basalt, a material not native to the pyramid's vicinity, raises immediate questions about the tools and methods employed by the ancients.
These lines, distinct from mere scratches, display a pattern indicative of saw marks, suggesting the use of advanced machining technology far beyond the capabilities of bronze chisels or saws, even when aided by abrasive materials like silica sand. Further scrutiny of the area uncovers additional examples that hint at the utilization of older, yet highly advanced machining techniques. For instance, remnants of saw cuts with diameters approximating 1.8 to 1.4 of an inch reveal not only the precision, but also the possibility of curved cuts, potentially pointing towards the use of giant circular saws. This evidence contradicts the traditional narrative that attributes the pyramid's construction to simple tools and manual labor. In front of the second pyramid, we can find many remnants of molten granite within channels extending from the pyramid towards the Sphinx. A particularly striking discovery is a limestone block with a channel of molten granite running through it showcasing a vivid array of colors and hinting at the intense heat it must have endured. This, along with areas of charred granite and limestone, raises intriguing questions about the processes and events that led to these conditions. Observations of the original external casing stones further complicate the story. The extremely tight fit between these stones suggests a level of craftsmanship and precision that is difficult to reconcile with the tools supposedly available during the pyramid's construction. The Great Pyramid and its two smaller pyramids are placed in the exact same manner as the three stars that make up Orion's Belt. The last time the pyramids aligned with Orion's Belt was about 10,450 years ago. This strongly suggests the pyramids are at least 10,000 years old and are probably much older. Perhaps that would explain why there's no mention of the pyramids or their creation in any of the Egyptian writings. Such evidence challenges the established chronology of Egyptian history and suggests that the Great Pyramid, and possibly its neighbors, might have pre-existed the dynastic Egyptian civilization. Most people think that the pyramids of Giza are just these three large pyramids. However, the complex is filled with numerous smaller structures, including many small pyramids that still bear their original casing stones. There are also numerous shafts and tunnels, like the Osiris Shaft, which hint at the notion that there's a massive subterranean complex below the Giza Plateau. Situated at 115 feet, or 35 meters below the surface, the Osiris shaft leads to what is referred to as the Tomb of Osiris. It features a granite sarcophagus at the center of a chamber, surrounded by an artificial canal filled with water. The question that naturally arises is, how did they ensure a reliable water source to fill this canal? And moreover, how did they manage to maintain the water at precisely the right level? The only plausible explanation for this feat is the existence of an advanced underground hydrological system of chambers and tunnels in the vicinity, specifically designed to harness and direct water from a natural spring into the shaft. The solid bedrock in the area rules out the chance of random leaks, further supporting the theory that the water is supplied via a deliberately constructed concealed channel. The implications of such a channel are profound, indicating a monumental subterranean engineering project unparalleled in its time. The true purpose of this subterranean structure is a mystery, and there aren't any ladders or any other method to even go down there. So how did they manage to place massive granite sarcophagi weighing up to 40 tons each inside the structure? Furthermore, the decision to bring these massive granite boxes underground instead of carving them directly into the bedrock meant a specific purpose was attached to these objects or the material they were made of. There was one sarcophagus that was not made of granite, though. It was made from dacite, a material that was not used for any other known object in ancient Egypt's history. Not only that, this material cannot be found anywhere in Africa. This means that whoever built the shaft, 
transported this massive 40-ton dacite sarcophagus over vast distances, possibly from across the Mediterranean. The application of advanced dating techniques has revealed that the shaft is most likely at least 5,000 years old, pushing back the timeline of this site to pre-dynastic periods. But let's get back to the Great Pyramid of Giza. According to measurements, the Great Pyramid is the most accurately aligned structure in existence and faces true north with only 3 sixtieths of a degree of error. The position of the North Pole moves over time and the pyramid was exactly aligned at one time. Even more incredibly, the Great Pyramid is located at the center of the landmass of the Earth. The east-west parallel that crosses the most land and the north-south meridian that crosses the most land intersect in two places on the Earth, one in the ocean and the other at the Great Pyramid. This alignment was achieved without the compass, which would not be invented for thousands of years. Such precision suggests a profound understanding of astronomy and possibly the use of star sightings or other advanced methods to determine cardinal directions with astounding accuracy. The builders of the pyramids had such detailed knowledge of the solstices and equinoxes that on the day of the spring equinox, the sun shines directly over the Great Pyramid, and in those few moments the pyramid does not cast a shadow. Another interesting feature is the acoustic qualities within the pyramid, particularly within the king's chamber. The chamber is constructed from huge blocks of granite, a material known for its density and sound-reflecting abilities. When vocalizations or sounds are made within this chamber, they resonate, creating a powerful and reverberating acoustic effect. This resonance doesn't merely amplify sound, it seems to enhance it, giving it a quality that is both profound and enduring. Listen to these acoustic demonstrations from Brian Forrester's video in which he examines the King's Chamber together with Yusef Awiyan, an expert of acoustic resonance. The sound can linger in the air far longer than one would expect, leading researchers to propose that the pyramid's architects might have intentionally incorporated these acoustic features. The specific dimensions and materials chosen for the king's chamber, and possibly other parts of the pyramid, could have been meticulously selected to achieve a particular resonance frequency. This suggests a level of knowledge and intentionality in the use of sound that is quite advanced, indicating the practical significance of acoustics in the pyramid's design. One of the most astounding theories of all emerged in the 1960s, thanks to a man named Edward Kunkel. In 1962, Kunkel published a book entitled Pharaoh's Pump, which shook up the world of Egyptology. In it, he argued that the passages and chambers in and beneath the Great Pyramid were the conduits and reservoirs of a giant water pump that would have been used to send water out into the desert to irrigate the land. According to Kunkel, the pyramid actually contained two pumps, one underground, represented by the pyramid's mysterious subterranean chamber, and the other above ground in the middle and upper chambers. Together, they would create two streams that would exit the pyramid through shafts on the north and south sides. Unsurprisingly, Kunkel's work caused great skepticism, not only from Egyptologists who rejected the theory outright, but from engineers who pointed out that Kunkel's design would have required the creation of a vacuum, a number of valves, and some type of combustible fuel and combustion chamber to drive the pump. Yet, 
Not bound by the same restrictions as mainstream Egyptology, many engineers began to look closer at Kunkel's work, realizing that it was not totally without merit. While Kunkel's two-pump design would likely not have been possible, some engineers noted that a ram pump might actually make sense. A ram pump is a simple device used for centuries to move water from a reservoir to somewhere else using two moving parts and the force of gravity. Could the builders of the Great Pyramid really have created a ram pump on such a massive scale? With the possibility established, other researchers and scholars picked up on the idea, designing a theoretical layout in which the Great Pyramid was fed with water from the Western Nile and nearby Lake Morris, which each sat at a higher elevation, making them the perfect sources for a gravity-fed water system on the Giza Plateau. Some even believe that the retaining wall, which is known to have once surrounded the pyramid complex, could have been an embankment for an on-site reservoir. As more and more people came to believe that the Great Pyramid really could have been an enormous ancient water pump, they were backed by one simple overarching argument, economics. Think about it. The Great Pyramid is made up of 2.3 million blocks, each weighing between 25 and 80 tons, meaning that if workers moved and laid 12 blocks per hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it would have taken 20 years to construct. More than that, it has been estimated that, adjusted into modern dollar values, the pyramid would have cost more than $5 billion to create. Simply, why go to all this trouble and all this expense just for a tomb? Obviously, Egyptian pharaohs had more leeway than modern, democratically elected leaders, but they were not totally unbound from the realities of finance and economics. Would it not make more sense to go to all this trouble for something which was going to provide a higher return on investment like, say, a water pump which would allow you to irrigate your civilization and feed your people? Here, we must take a step back in order to get to the point. If the Great Pyramid really was an enormous water pump, then it must have been pumping the water somewhere. This is where some have connected the dots and returned to the mysterious pit at Zawiyat el Aryan. They believe that the site was not an unfinished pyramid, but an outflow location for water pumped by the Great Pyramid, the giant pit designed as a reservoir for water pumped in from below. It might actually go much further than pumping water for irrigation. Early in 1999, a marine engineer named John Cadman was perusing the shelves at a used bookstore when he stumbled across an old, dusty copy of a most unusual book, Pharaoh's Pump. As an expert in hydraulics, the book intrigued Cadman, so he purchased it and took it home. When he began to read it more closely, he quickly realized that Kunkel's idea was not as ridiculous as he had initially assumed. Wanting to know more, Cadman began to learn everything he could about the Great Pyramid. Almost immediately, what he discovered captivated him. The Great Pyramid's subterranean chamber, he realized, looked eerily like the layout for a ram pump. He took his research further, noting from photographs that the subterranean chamber showed obvious signs of water damage, particularly on the ceiling where signs of cavitation, which is caused by gas bubbles in water due to violent churning, were evident as well as clear damage from compression waves striking it. In other words, it was not just that the subterranean chamber could work as a water pump, but according to Cadman's trained eyes, it appeared it had worked as such. At this point, Cadman knew what he had to do. He must draw upon his years of experience with hydraulics and create his own scale model of the pyramid and its subterranean chamber to see if it would really work as a water pump. He built his first model, using a nearby river as a reservoir. Unfortunately, the model did not work, first leaking, then cracking and failing to pump water as he had hoped. But Cadman would not give up that easily. He built another model, then another, both of which suffered the same fate as the first. But on his fourth try, he got everything right, 
and much to Cadman's delight, his pump worked. This proved to Cadman beyond a doubt that the Great Pyramid could have functioned as a giant water pump, and that surely this was not by accident. It was clear, he asserted, that the creators of the Great Pyramid's subterranean chamber had known exactly what they were doing. This was the breakthrough that disciples of Edward Kunkel's original work had been waiting for, the tangible proof that a Great Pyramid water pump was more than just speculation. And yet, as Cadman continued his research, the results got even more mind-blowing, and in fact, went far beyond the mere pumping of water. Having proved that the Great Pyramid's subterranean chamber could function as a water pump, Cadman built a new, bigger model and encased it in concrete in order to simulate the effects of the pump operating underground. He moved the model, which weighed over 500 pounds, to a seasonal creek with a pond serving as a reservoir. As this model began to work, Cadman immediately noticed something which shocked him. Encased in concrete, the pump was creating a vertical compression wave, a recurring heartbeat-like thump which could be felt through the ground 20 feet away and heard more than 100 feet away. Cadman realized that what he had constructed went far beyond just a water pump. Because of the powerful waves it generated, Cadman renamed the device a pulse generator. Truly, this changed everything. If the Great Pyramid's subterranean chamber was generating pulse waves, these waves would have moved through the granite upper chambers and passageways of the pyramid, and due to granite's reflective properties, created ionization in the atmosphere, in effect, producing an electric field. Put more simply, the pulses created by the subterranean pump would have interacted with the pyramid's granite to produce electricity. It appeared that Cadman had not only proven that the Great Pyramid could function as a water pump to move water around Egypt for irrigation, but one which could actually create electricity in ancient times. Of course, those who have watched this channel before will know that the idea of the Great Pyramid as an electrical generator did not start with John Cadman. In fact, as early as the turn of the 20th century, it appeared prominently in the work of famed inventor Nikola Tesla. But while many of you will already be aware of the work of Tesla, you may not be aware of his obsession with ancient Egypt, and specifically the pyramids, which he studied in detail, wrote about, and incorporated into his work. Consider, in 1905, Tesla filed a patent titled Art of Transmitting Electrical Energy Through a Natural Medium, which contained the design for something called Tesla's Electromagnetic Pyramid. Supplementing his genius with what he had learned about ancient Egypt, his idea was to use a huge pyramid-like structure to project energy skyward where it could then be harnessed by individual receptors around the world. Interestingly, Tesla actually built a model of his electromagnetic pyramid known as Wardenclyffe Tower, a 187-foot-tall structure topped with a 55-ton dome of conductive metal. Unfortunately, before he could conclusively prove that his model could create energy, Tesla lost his funding and the project was abandoned. And yet, even though Tesla's work on electromagnetic pyramids disappeared, the idea did not. Thanks to Tesla, many began to look at the Great Pyramid with fresh eyes, and specifically its original makeup covered in white tufa limestone blocks, which are known for unparalleled insulating properties, its tunnels and chambers beneath lined with granite, a well-known electrical conductor. Simply, this would have been the perfect layout if the intent was to create and utilize electricity little granite channels of electrical conductivity surrounded by insulation, not unlike copper wires encased in rubber in modern electronic devices. Moreover, it is known that the Great Pyramid was originally topped by a capstone of gold, one of the most electrically conductive materials on Earth, similar to how Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower was topped with a 55-ton metal ball. In other words, if the Great Pyramid was designed for electricity, 
its builders couldn't have done it better. And if it wasn't, well, in an historic coincidence, they'd accidentally stumbled into the perfect design. To add to the mystery, in 1993, a mysterious and inaccessible room was discovered after remaining hidden for thousands of years. Appearing to have deliberately been concealed by the structure's engineers, the room came to be called the Queen's Chamber and was finally explored in 2011 with a small remote camera to reveal something very strange. It contained carefully crafted copper wire and more importantly, there were instructions painted as symbols onto the floor which appeared to show a clear wiring diagram. You can run an electric current through copper wire and the coil will produce a short range magnetic field. Add a second coil and the power is transferred from one coil to the other. A windowless room with copper wirings could create a higher potential on one wall which transfers energy to the lower potential, consequentially releasing electromagnetic energy into the confined space of the so-called Queen's Chamber. Indeed, so suggestive was the evidence that the idea continued to develop into modern times. Christopher Dunn is a mechanical engineer who has worked for more than half a century at the highest levels of aerospace manufacturing. In the 1970s, Dunn began to develop an interest in the mysteries of the Great Pyramid of Giza. At the same time as he worked his day job in the aerospace industry, he began spending his spare time researching the Great Pyramid from a mechanical engineering perspective. Slowly but surely, he came to the belief that there was more to the pyramid than it seemed. In his words, I came to the conclusion that with such an investment of resources and the extreme precision which was crafted into the building, it was a building that functioned as a machine and the machine was used to harness energy from the earth. I was inspired to research and discover how this machine operated. For more than 20 years, he conducted this research becoming a prominent expert on the subject, publishing dozens of articles and appearing as a trusted voice across mainstream television. They were tuned to vibrate with the frequencies of the Earth, and they converted the energies of the Earth into electromagnetic energy. In 1998, one year before John Cadman's legendary experiments which proved the electrical capacity of the Great Pyramid, Dunn finally published his seminal work, titled The Giza Power Plan. The book meticulously described a system in which the Great Pyramid drew seismic energy from the Earth, producing electricity in the King's Chamber through the use of hydrogen created by a chemical reaction in the Queen's Chamber. So groundbreaking was Dunn's work that it inspired researchers around the world to follow his lead. For more than two decades, research has continued and expanded, becoming only more astonishing every year. In fact, more than ever, science, and specifically mainstream science, is taking the idea of the Great Pyramid as an electrical generator seriously. Indeed, in 2018, a study was published in the prestigious Journal of Applied Physics, which examined the Great Pyramid's response to radio waves, and concluded that the pyramid could in fact concentrate electromagnetic energy in its internal chambers as well as under its base, seeming to confirm the research of Cadman and the ideas of Tesla. Then, in 2019, a new book was published by Egyptologists James Brown and J.J. and Desiree Hertog, entitled Giza's Industrial Complex, which built on the work of Dunn to suggest that the entire Giza Plateau functioned as an energy-generating system. According to the authors, the structures around and beneath the plateau were designed to activate a sophisticated process of water splitting, which would allow hydrogen to be used as a fuel source. As they put it in the book, there is good evidence that the Great Pyramid was a gigantic water processing plant to create electrified water. It is indicative of how far the idea of the Great Pyramid as an electrical generator has come that the book and the idea were not immediately written off as ridiculous, 
In fact, instead of being mocked, the book actually won awards, including the prestigious New York City Big Book Award. Again, now more than ever, mainstream science views the possibility of the Great Pyramid as an electrical generator as imminently possible. In pondering the grandeur of Egypt's ancient structures and the sophisticated technologies they imply, one compelling theory emerges that these marvels are not solely the achievements of the historically known dynastic Egyptians, but rather the remnants of a far more advanced ancient civilization. This civilization, predating recorded history, could have passed down a wealth of knowledge and technological prowess, setting the foundation upon which later Egyptians built and thrived. Such achievements prompt us to consider the possibility that these were not the initial experiments of an emerging civilization, but rather the inherited legacy of a predecessor whose knowledge and achievements were monumental enough to influence generations long after their disappearance. This theory does not diminish the accomplishments of the dynastic Egyptians, but rather highlights a continuity of human achievement and the potential for civilizations to build upon the legacies left by their predecessors. It suggests that the ancient Egyptians were inheritors of a rich and sophisticated legacy, which they adapted and preserved. 